Beyond the Ranch with Jay Gunnan from Find the Ranch. Welcome to Beyond the Wrench. I am your host, Jay Ganinen. Today's guest is one that I've really been looking forward to getting on the show. He's universally known throughout the independent repair world, has spoken at the Ratchet and Wrench Management Conference, and is also the owner of Avalon Motorsports and Urban Auto Care. On top of that, Brian was a, a panelist at Tech Mission, the, the uh, conference that we just did not too long ago, and added some incredible insight for all of us to learn from. And today is a really, really exciting day for Brian and everything that he's doing because he's being recognized uh, as the ACA Apex Shop Owner of the Year. Uh, you're getting that award later today as we record this. Uh, congratulations, Brian. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Jay, man. Yeah, it's, it's uh, super humbling. And, you know, I mean, we have some powerhouse dynamite leaders in this industry and to even be talked about. In the same sentence as, as those um, men and women is, is humble. And then also it's humbling being with you and you guys have an amazing organization. And uh, you know, I know we've got some fun things to talk about today. We do, we do. And I, I think what's exciting to me about talking to you, Brian, is, is your story is a little bit different than a lot of other people's story and how you got to where you're at today and how you got into shop ownership. Can you give us a little, uh, a little background on, on how you grew up, you have kind of an athletic background uh, that then kind of transitioned. It's, it's different than any other shop owner that I've talked to, right? And I, I think it's, a, it's such a fascinating background. So I'm interested to hear uh, more about what you've got there. Yeah, well, there's actually probably a little more to it than you even know. Um, and so I'll start just kind of, so I'm a Denver, Colorado native, which there are, I feel there are fewer and fewer of us, <laughs> but it's, it's cool. And, and Colorado is a beautiful state. Um, I was actually, I loved uh, music and sports. I was very gifted in music. And so I graduated high school at the Denver School of the Arts, Performing Arts School. And I played clarinet and alto saxophone. And I was one of the top five clarinet players in the state of Colorado in my senior year. Uh, and we had a top 20 jazz band in the country. It was so kind of crazy. It is. But I didn't I know loved, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I love sports, though. I mean, I grew up playing baseball. My senior year of high school, I stopped uh, participating in marching band and went out for football. And we had a very highly recruited football program here in Denver. And I got a, like a small scholarship to go to an engineering school, the Colorado School of Mines, to play football. So I went from I, this very smooth transition from a performing arts school to an engineering school to play football. So that, that was a path probably less traveled in and of itself. Wow. And uh, so I studied civil engineering and I kind of got the hang of this football thing. I ended up being a two-time All-American, Division II. Um, and was uh, recruited and signed to play professionally. So I went to some NFL camps and played arena football for five years. And then, uh, you know, had a blast doing what I think many people who love sports uh, would consider their dream job. Yeah. You know, and got to do that for several years and won the Arena Bowl, a world championship with the Chicago Rush in 2006. And then a year later, while I was still under contract, uh, you know, just some things happened in my life and God said, you're, you're done with football. So I transitioned into business within 30 days. Uh, and that, that business happened to be Avalon Motorsports, which I opened today, uh, own today rather. And so the interesting thing about Avalon when we started was it basically, I, I purchased a website, a, you know, a name, uh, online marketplace where we sold performance upgrades for German cars. And I mean, there wasn't much, it was kind of a broken company at the time. There wasn't a whole lot left of it. We, we sold a few thousand dollars in parts a month. I mean, it was pretty small. Uh, and six months later, I you know, had this revelation that, man, if we could go get our own shop, we could not only perform installs ourselves, we could actually do service and repair and this kind of thing. So, um, so that, was, that was kind of the foray into automotive service. And uh, yeah, just kind of a, an interesting journey there up to that point. But you know, it was uh, pursuing passions and talents and find out where you go and where it gets you. How, so what, what was the interest in cars to even, to sell the, the, the performance upgrades? Uh, what, what drew you to that point? Well, it was just that. It was interest in cars. Um, you know, I kind of, I, as I was transitioning out of football, I, I had this moment, I mean, a, a very challenging time, as you can imagine, uh, emotionally, but um, I, I, my mother had passed away a year prior. I had custody of my little sister, 
and just some obligations change. And, and so I ask the question, and I, when I teach business owners and entrepreneurialism, I, I often ask this, but I pose this question. If you could, if you could pursue any dream job or do, do anything you could choose to do and find a way to make a living at it, what would you do? And it, it kind of, it's a fun process just to start thinking. I mean, people have a myriad of answers. I mean, they could think of anything under the sun. But for me, I, you know, I was in high school and I bought, the first car I bought was a Volkswagen GTI. It was a 1991 Mark II and I put springs on it and an exhaust and some wheels and I think a short shifter. That kind of created this affinity for, for especially German cars and performance upgrades. And so that was, I was what, 17? And so fast forward probably exactly a decade later actually, um, then I went into business doing that and I answered that question the same way. I said, man, I would love to be around high-end cars and and so i went after it and um you know it seemed to work out pretty well that is so cool and and i i would be remiss as a football fan to not ask you how hard is an nfl training camp like how that sounds i mean for you to just go from like your senior year like oh this football thing seems pretty easy and i'm going to make <laughs> make a career out of it i i could not imagine that i mean the the progression that you had to go from just picking up football to being, you know, basically on an NFL roster only a few years later, that is insane to me. Yeah. Yeah. It was five years. It was, it was exactly five years and uh, it was brutal. It was, it was, it was the most physically demanding thing that, that I've ever done. And not keep in mind in 2003, my first training camp was with the San Diego chargers, okay. uh, people like Drew Brees, uh, Danny and Tomlinson, oh you know, Hall of Famers, which is really cool. But our head coach was Marty Schottenheimer. And Marty was notorious for being a grinder and old school. And I think we had 19 or 20 uh, two-a-days, right? It was kind of three-a-days, really. Um, we didn't have one break for almost three weeks. And other teams had been they, – they were, like, breaking camp, and we still didn't even have, a day, like, an afternoon off. Wow. And it was so it was grueling and grinding, and uh, I definitely realized my physical limits in life. I think during that, time. <laughs> how how was it? I, did, were you starstruck at all when you go in to to see some of these people? Um, you, you try not to be. You are a little bit, but you're like I, like I've got to focus everything I have on on the task at hand and not get too enamored in writing coattails. Um, but it, it was a great journey. I met a lot of really cool people and I, I spent some time, you know, I, I would eat lunch with Drew Brees anytime I could during training camp. And he was a very gracious person. And, uh, and the next year I was around people like um, Marshall Falk, uh, Corey Holt, Isaac Bruce, you know, some other hall of famers and unreal, you know, you just, you just adjust. I mean, that's why that's why you're uh, a better person, not only just from the athletic standpoint, but if I would have saw any of those people, I would have passed out uh, due to <laughs> being starstruck. So you you yeah. uh, you're <laughs> you're far more prepared and better for that than I would ever be. Uh, yeah. But really cool. So talk to me a little bit about getting into shop life then, and and yeah. really that transition from uh, athletics into running a shop. Uh, you didn't have a ton of background in that prior to, to, to kind of jumping into that side, right? Yeah, I had none really. I, that's not true actually. I worked for, so I worked for Avalon Motorsports as this online marketplace about three years prior during an off season. So it was like three months of, of 2004 maybe. Sure. And I went, I was kind of in the shipping and taking in orders on the phone. So I, so I kind of knew how to do that. But when we opened up, we, we leased a little industrial garage, like, you know, biz, you know, business park complex thing. There's like a bunch of little garages in there. It was like 2,600 square feet. And um, my dad and I just kind of remodeled that on our own during the weekends. And then, so I, so I hired, I put an ad out and hired a guy named Phil, who was an Audi certified technician. And, and so, so he shows up, this is like September of 07. And he's like, okay, so he accepts the job. We, today, he's still with me today. And I'll, there's a story about Phil who's amazing. He's our director of operations. Um, to this day, we still kind of laugh. Like, why did you accept this job? He's like, I have no idea. <laughs> it's crazy an act of God, really. But um, so he shows up and he's like, okay, where's the lifts? And I'm like, it's right over there. And it was, this lift had been delivered and was sitting on the ground in the shop. He's like, who's installing it? And I'm like, we are. And he's like, cool. So his first day, first two days of work, we're, we're installing a lift. And, you know, that, that was kind of a analogous uh, to uh, to how we started I mean it was we I didn't know anything and Phil came from a dealership he was there four years but it was very I mean it was very 
rudimentary. I mean, we were like scribbling things on scratch paper and tearing it off and I would run to the phone and call a customer. And I mean, it was really unorganized and chaotic, you know? So um, we did that for about two years. And, and at that time I got invited through world pack, you know, big part supplier. Most of us are familiar with to go to the expo in Orlando in late 2009 that was my first taste of like uh, uh, consultants and training and in industry training. And I met some great people and my eyes were really open to this opportunity that at the time was just an immense opportunity to build a business in automotive. And so I came back and we, we founded a, a world packed, you know, 20 group smart group in Denver. And I was one of the founding members and kind of started surrounding myself with people that knew what they were doing. And um, it eventually got my first paycheck and we were just getting our, butts kicked, frankly, we, yeah. we were just getting, you know, we were making a dollar. So, um, you know, it was kind of a, kind of a fun journey. And once, I mean, there's just so many ways to learn craft and industry and better yourself. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity. I'm really thankful for people early on. Some maybe even me watching this that, um, that really poured into me and, and kind of made a path to, to success in the industry. That is, that's awesome. That is so cool. So how, how long have you been in business now? Well, it'll be 14 years in February. Congratulations. Uh, so yeah, 14 years in February, you know, we, we had Avalon Motorsports, our, our German import specialist, that that's the company where we service German cars. And that's where we started. Um, and then in 2011, I get a call from Ratchet and Wrench. They're like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to have this first ever publication and we want you to be on the front of it. And I was like, <laughs> what? Like, I don't think you understand two years ago, I wasn't making a dime. We were just getting our, you know, we were just getting beat up in this deal. And and uh, they had they had reached out to a couple of consultants in the industry and say, we want to do a story on leadership. And these guys were like, the two consultants actually were like, yeah, you got to talk to this guy, Brian. And so I get this call and I mean, I'm four years into business and they're like, yeah, we want to put, put you on the cover of this magazine. I'm like, this is, cr this is not like normal stuff, you know? Um, and then three years later in 2014, we were a motor age top 10 shop when, when motor age did, did the, it was, you know, a big deal. And, and we, and we won that. And, and about that time, we were starting to consider a second location. And so uh, we were actually looking to open a second location for Avalon to, to be extend the German uh, brands. But this opportunity came up for one of our peers in the, in the smart group, the 20 group, uh, that he was going to sell his shop, which was an awesome little general repair shop just outside of downtown. Matter of fact, it was about two and a half miles from Avalon and they service like Asian imports and American. It was, it was, it was awesome. So we're like, yeah, so we purchased that location and rebranded it as urban auto care. And that was our, so now we had the, these kind of sister shops, two different brands, but one family of companies that the canal service, like the Asian imports and, and domestic cars for the clients we had that, that own German cars and we could kind of cross market and do some of that. And, uh, and that was kind of the, the start into the general repair world under urban auto care. And that to me is fascinating because I think you took a different approach at it uh, from almost that entrepreneurship side rather than a, you know, a lot of shop owners where they get stuck is that they're so focused and a lot of them were technicians growing up that they get stuck kind of working on putting out fires over the course of a day in a shop. And it really, it handicaps their ability to be able to really build the business and, and really be aggressive. And and what I love about what your approach is, Brian, is that that growth mindset, right? And that that really trying to expand the brand and expand the quality of the brand. And I, walk me through the the thinking there, right? W with yeah. going to multiple locations and going to, you know, really having that mindset of, you know, what we want to expand this thing. What what yeah. you, what goes through your mind when you're when you're looking at opening another location or or doing something along those lines? Yeah. Well, you, you actually made two really important comments that I'm, I'm going to stick on for a second, because I think they segue us really, really nicely in, into what we're going to talk about next. You said so two things. You, you said that I wasn't in the industry uh, prior. We, we kind of we kind of know that now. And then the second thing you said is putting out fires. So the first year I taught at Ratchet and Wrench, they, they, the title of the, the first um, you know, seminar or whatever I did was how to stop putting out fires and build your business. So it's funny you say that. <laughs> and the whole premise is that we get so intertwined in the business and it's the tyranny of the urgent and it's putting out fires that we can't ever work on our business. And, and that's what you commented on. I think one of the most beautiful things and, and also probably most challenging things about the fact that I wasn't in industry was I, I'm, I'm unlike many of shop owners who were technicians. I can't just go in and, and plug the gaps, you know, plug the holes in the dam 
in the, in the back of the shop when a tech goes down or when I can't hire somebody, you know, I, I couldn't do that. So I had to force myself to be able to find great technicians. And, um, and so that, so that was an impetus for, for not, you know, masking an issue or not really, or, you know, focusing on growing the company and hiring great people and that whole process, which we'll talk a little bit about today. And, um, you know, we've had some amazing, we still have some amazing team members and some people that helped us grow along the way. But I, but one of the things I taught in that first session, how to stop putting out fires and build your business was if you could write down the three things that you hate doing most in your business, what would those three things be? And it could be any, I mean, it could be a person that's like, I hate wrenching. I don't want to do, I don't want to go in the shop. I want to take my toolbox home and not go back. Um, people say hiring, they say finance, you know, marketing, whatever it is. And so that's a great starting place. And so if you want to build your business, then maybe, maybe work on how do you solve the problem? Let somebody else handle the three things that you hate doing so you can do the things you love doing. That might be a place where somebody could start. And um, so, but early on, you know, you have to do a lot of things as an entrepreneur yeah. and, and, uh, and I, I did and, and many days still do, but um, you know, so since that time we've, we've added two more shops and we're under contract. So we have four now and we're hoping to close our fifth in January of this year. And I, I, our driver for growth is really twofold. One is to be able to, we, we think we have a unique business model and we'd like to take that to more communities. You know, we really, we really believe that we, we can impact uh, our communities and our areas very positively and transform the industry from the inside out. Uh, and we want to take that to more areas around, you know, our, our region. But even more so is that we want to be driven to grow by our people. So when you create career opportunities and upward mobility, then, then that is the impetus for growth rather than us saying, hey, we selfishly want to grow again. We're going to cause this shop to suffer and this community to suffer. And we selfishly we want to make more profit. Now we got to go, we're just going to backfill or hire in to fill these positions. We like to have a bench, if you will, football analogy, yeah. of great up and coming team members. And in order to eliminate the ceiling, the glass ceiling that's over them, and in which many cases they would leave the company and go find somewhere else. We'd like to, we'd like to keep them in the company and provide that opportunity for growth. And, and I think the combination of those things has been very effective for us. So the, that segues really nicely into our conversation today, right? And, and really what we're focused on, which is some of this technician recruitment and retainment, you do it as, as well as anybody I want to start by asking you what it is that you look for in somebody when you're when you're bringing them on, right? Are you looking for uh, mechanical aptitude? Are you looking for attitude? Are you looking for you know what are what are some areas that when you're when you're looking for somebody to come into to Avalon or Urban that really they check the boxes to to fit your culture? Yeah, well, we we use we like acronyms and, and we're, I guess we're kind of like the military. We have a few that are very important to us, but when it comes to hiring, our fundamental uh, acronym for hiring is three H's. Okay. And it's, it's happy, hungry, and humble. Mm. And the way we describe that is like happiness can be a fleeting emotion. I mean, you don't have to be bouncing off the walls, like, you know, uh, over, uh, over excessively, but we want somebody who has a general positive attitude. They're going to treat others well and be, be relatively friendly and expect the best possible outcome in every scenario. So, so that's, that's the first age. And then hungry, and originally it started with hunger, because we, we, we would find that we bring these people in, if their desire is, is big enough, and, and they have a desire to be great, man, we could sure, we can get them there. Uh, and so, you know, they, they have the desire to be great, to, to pursue excellence. And then humble, we define that by saying, look, we love confidence. We're, we're all about confidence, but arrogance can cripple an organization. So. We're going to check our ego at the door. We're going to get in here. We're going to work our butts off, have a blast doing it, but remain humble enough that you want to continue to learn and grow, you know, cause none of us, in fact, the way we define excellence as a cornerstone value of our company is always striving for your highest potential. So it's like golf, right? You, you wanted to shoot the 79 you did. So then you got to, now you want to shoot a 75 and then you want, you know, so that, that bar is always rising as you continue to grow and excel and, and improve in your craft. So that, that's the three things. Now I know many people are going to be listening to this and go, okay, so, so we're talking about technicians here. So let's just throw the happy one out the window. Um, but you know, it's, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Right. 
And so what, what I challenge business owners in any industry, specifically in automotive with, is you can't be hiring from desperation. That, that's rule number one. Like, so you, ha- you can't just hire when you have to because you're going to make, you're going to compromise. We all do it, you know, because you're hemorrhaging. I mean, I, I like to teach a calculation and I say, okay, let's make some basic assumptions from a financial analysis perspective so that every single person can understand what you're losing without having a tech. And, and the basic equation is, let's say that for every hour of labor in your shop, you build $200, you know, $100 of labor, $100 in parts. That's pretty common around, I mean, that's, that, you know, that's pretty common. So yep. if half of that is margin, and I know many people are gonna say, well, we should be at 55 or 60%, but well, let's just assume half of that is gross profit margin. You make you know, 50% on parts and labor. It's $100 in gross profit for every hour you sell. And so when, when you're talking about 40 hours a week for a tech, to, let's say they're just 40 hour production. That, and every month, I mean, that's, that's 4,000 a week. So 40 hours times $100, $17,333 a month in gross profit you lose from not having that tech. Hmm. And so when you hire from desperation, not only are you losing that, but you're going to make a compromise. And it could be in one of the three H's. By the way, Jay, you're exactly right. One of my peers challenged me on this recently and said, well, Brian, but they have to have aptitude. And, and that is correct. That's an assumption that wherever, whatever level you're hiring at, they have to have a competency in that area. But culturally, we're not going to sacrifice the three H's just to have the aptitude. Love it. Okay, we won't do that because you end up, we've all been held hostage by a team member, may, maybe specifically a technician. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to just, I'm not trying to harp on text because technicians, by the way, Without you, we make nothing. Yes. You're incredibly valuable to us. And I think every shop owner in the country would say, we need more of you. So understand how much you're valued. But high value financially with a bad attitude is not a good combo. So, so you've got to be proactive. And we'll talk a little bit about this, Jay. I think just the methodology. Yeah. But that's what we look for culturally. And, and by the way, in terms of culture, every shop has one. Some of them are really good. Some of them are really bad. But we define culture as what do people see and how do they feel when you're in your company? Whether it's a, a client, a vendor, a team member, whatever. What do they see and how do they feel about your company when they're in it? And so you have to work really hard to promote a, and create a positive culture where people feel you know, appreciated and productive uh, in their craft. And I have a lot more on that, but we can... But- you know, we can talk about that. Well, a key, a key point that it, I absolutely love everything you're saying here too, Brian, because it is so important and something we try to teach to our clients too, with the, the proactive uh, recruiting in that, that bench side, building a bench, but it is so true. And when, when we land that home with people that you make poor decisions when you're desperate, like that, that is such a key point that we, we can't seem to get through with a lot of people, right? That, that they expect that you can just put an ad in the paper and that you're just going to find that person tomorrow. It's just not that way anymore. And when you get the pressure and you get your, your back put up against the wall and you need to hire somebody, you're probably not going to stick to your three H's, right? And that's where I, I love your approach. I, I think if people could take that home, it's such an important piece to to what a good business looks like. Yeah. So let's take this further, Jay. If that's cool yeah. with you. Yes. So Jay, have you, have you ever been fishing? Yes. Did you did you have good experiences or not good experiences? Fishing? Probably not as good of experiences okay. because I'm a terrible fisherman. But no. <laughs> I've always said like fishing is kind of like math. Like if you had a good math teacher, you probably like math. If you had a bad math teacher, you didn't like it. So <laughs> if you didn't catch any fish, you probably hate fishing. But if you caught it, you're like, I love fishing. So yes. somewhere in there. But but so. So I like to think of hiring as fishing and and I'll talk a little bit about that, but so are you ready for the second acronym today? Yes. The second acronym is going to, is going to tie into fishing. And so we have to think of recruiting like fishing. And I think this, this helps a lot to do this. So the, the first, this acronym that we use is ABC and it stands for always be casting. And the general principle is, is you've got to commit to casting, you know, the bait, you've got to commit to fishing year round. So in that previous financial example, you know, we were $17,000 a month in gross profit from just an average productive tech, 160 hours a month, 40 hours a week, um, or 168 hours a month, whatever that is. 
And so let's just, let's just focus on that. If you, have, if you lose a tech for one month, you lose $17,000 in gross profit. So why not, let's just, give an, let's just pick a number and say, say you spend $1,000 a month on recruiting. That's, that's only 12,000 a year, but yet you could lose 17,000 in one month. So we have to understand the opportunity cost. What are we losing if we don't do this? Let alone the cost of stress and cultural disruption, uh, upset clients, you know, cause you can't service their car. I mean, all the drama. Okay. So always be casting. So, so let's take this fishing analogy a little bit further. Um, the big, there's some big chains and franchises that really get this. And that's why they're getting, our technicians are getting handwritten cards from these agencies. Right. And, and I love, um, find a wrench by the way, Jay. In fact, we're just, we have a team member starting in a week that was recruited by, um, your organization. So thank you. And yeah, I'm a yeah. believer in that, but there's professional recruiters that are hiring your technicians right now. If you're watching I promise. And, and they're getting these handwritten cards and they're, they're making it feel like the world. So there's other people casting and if you don't do it, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be the, on the other end of that stick. So, um, so I think there's a, a few key points in this fishing analogy. First, you got to cast your bait with precision, which means you got to like, you ever, if, if you ever seen like a, a fly fisherman or a bass fisherman, I mean, they're casting their bait into this little pocket because that's where the fish are. And, and we'll talk more about that, but you've got to do it precisely. And you've got to also, you got to have the bait that matches what the fish want to eat. Okay. And I still see a lot of shop owners that are stuck in this old, like all they really offer is flat rate. Yeah. And that's, that's fine. But yet I don't think you're going to get the top prospects unless you have a really nice benefits package to go along with it. So maybe you have to up your labor rate a little bit to, to pay for some of that. But most of the, the, the top quality techs, you're not going to cut it just by having a high flat rate pay anymore or even a salary. I think you need to have some benefits. So you have to know what the technicians in your area are looking for and what is a competitive pay structure that's at least going to get you in the ballpark. Okay. And so then the next thing is when we talked about using the right bait when you're fishing, I think a lot of people to that financial analogy, they're afraid to use that expensive lure. I mean, I don't know when I teach this class, I ask people in the audience, like how much is an expensive lure? And I'll get six, eight, ten dollars, twelve dollars per per little piece of like bait, like artificial bait. Yeah. And I know what happens, a lot of fishermen are like, I'm afraid to use that one because I'll lose it. I'll snag and I'll break my line. But you know what? You're not going to catch anything if you're afraid of losing it one time. So, but you have to know what the right bait is and you have to, you have to use the expensive bait sometimes because we now know it can cost $70,000 or more a month in real profit dollars. Just if you don't have that guy or gal, whoever it is. And then, so then I talk about when you, this to me, Jay, this is the hardest part about year round recruiting. Yeah. Because I recruit, we recruit, even if we don't have a position open. And my director of ops, Phil, knows that I hate it because you can't take action. Like all you have to just keep this warm relationship. So one of the things you do when you're fishing is when the fish bites, you, you do what's called setting the hook. And you, you know, you set the hook. You ever see the, the pictures or videos of yeah. fish doing that? You have to set the hook, meaning you have to engage and initiate quickly. Because if you don't, somebody will. And and if if they're the first person to make that impression, they're gonna go down that pathway first and then if that doesn't work they might come back around you but so you got to be ready and quality bites are harder to get jay as you know so yeah. when you do get a bite you have to be ready to set the hook and at least take action so what i'm going to do is i'm going to get on a phone call right away i'm going to text phone call i'm going to text and say when can we talk get them on the phone get them in the organization to to interview see the location see the stores take them to lunch whatever i have to do if i'm not ready to hire i'm going to keep i'm going to keep taking them to lunch you know until there's a, a need for that. Okay. Yeah. So am I cool to keep going here, Jay? You, you are. I, and, and I, I don't know if you're going to touch on it or not, but one thing I do want to talk about is what you do when you're not hiring, but you do get that, that hook. Right. Yeah. And so we can, I, I don't want to cut you off in, in terms okay. of where you're going with that, but that is a question we get from uh, shops a lot is, okay, we want to do this proactive recruiting, but what happens when we get somebody we really like, what do we do? Yeah. Well, they're, they're, the way I see it, there's there's at least two options, two two primary options. One is you upgrade, and if you're if you're like me, like I mean, you pour a lot into your team and you love your people, or maybe you just have a soft heart and you have somebody that you don't really like or they're not really best, but you just have a hard time letting them go. I understand that, I get that totally. It's never easy letting somebody go, but if you've got an A tech that's ready to come into your company and you have a B minus tech that's really not cut it, but he's been with you five years and you're afraid to let him go. 
you've got a really tough decision. You know, is it hurting your company by having that B minus tech? Or is he a great guy that enhances the culture and he's just, he's a good role player in your company? Well then fine. Then, then you just have to go to uh, option B, what I consider option B, which is kind of what I talked about. You've got to, what, what we try to do is we try to pursue him a hundred percent until we find that, hey, we're in a good spot. And then we let them know and say, listen, Jay, here's the reality of our situation. We're actually, we don't have an opening right now. By the way, there's an option C that I can think of. I'll get to that in a minute. All right. We don't have an opening right now, but what I want to do is I want to know how do you feel about everything? Well, I feel great. I wish there was. Great. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help you because I know you just moved here. I know you're not good in your current situation. I, I want to, you know, use me as a resource. I, I want to encourage you and everything, but I want to have a great, strong friendship with you uh, in the months to come. And if something doesn't work out for you, I hope I'm the first person you call. If something doesn't work out for us, guess what? You're the first person I'm calling. Okay. And then you've got to keep that warm. You've got to, you've got to, you know, drip, drip on that lead. So, so to speak, whether it means again, connecting with them, taking them to lunch, uh, I'm sending them a little letter, inner letter or to text from time to time. How you doing? How's things at that new space, et cetera. And that's what you've got to do. You're courting. So them, I guess right? option yeah. C would be you spend money and you get them in. You know, and this is one of the hardest things for shop owners that I found is the cart and the horse of spending money to market to increase car count and the fact that that's going to hurt my profit and loss by spending that money. So if you can get a tech in and you've got some availability in your bays, which listen, I can tell you I have a three bay shop that's incredibly busy, three techs, three bays. And when you know what you can do in a scenario like that with 1800 total square feet, it changes how you look at bigger stores. So by the way, most of you as shop owners, you've got a lot of inventory of labor that you can still purchase and spend in your shop, even if you feel like you don't have enough room. So then you can just offer that person a guarantee, get them in, spend some money to market and, and teach your advisors how to say yes to everybody that calls and answer every phone call and, and really work the phones and the emails and get people in the door and then, and then ramp up your business. That's, that's how you, that's how you, one way you can grow. So I guess those are options that come to mind. For, you know, I, I, I love that approach because I'm far more aggressive. And uh, I think my mindset goes toward, okay, if you bring somebody in, is there a way that you can fit them in with the space limitations that you currently have, right? And the reason I say that is I, I think that for a growing business, the, the problem might change, right? So if you, if you add another technician, and say you do have the room or you can make do with what you've got, that it turns into more of a marketing or sales problem because you got to keep that person busy. And and so I'm, I, I think my mindset is, and it, honestly, it's kind of turned a little bit. Uh, I know my dad uh, at his shop us, utilizes some coaching where they talked about limiting the car count and making sure that you're you're really doing good productive inspections and you're doing, you know, you're, you're not running with your hair on fire all the time. And it's made a huge impact on their business. And I see that. And, and it's still for me, something where I've got to kind of train my brain to take a step back, analyze it, don't be so aggressive, because I, it can be a risky proposition. But I like your approach to it. I think that's uh, that I'm, I'm taking some notes here, too, because I'm just like, this is this is this is perfect. Yeah. Well, and, and keep in mind, I, uh, when AR, average repair order and car count is very much like a supply and demand curve, not in, not in, in actual subject matter, but in, but in theory. So when ARO goes up, car count usually goes down. When car count goes up, ARO usually goes down. And, and that's, that's a common thing. So there are a lot of shops that have plenty of cars, but you're at a $180 average ticket. And, and, and honestly, I think there's a lot of room for improvement on that ethically. Uh, by, and con conversely, there are some shops that have a really good average ticket and then that technician comes along and they're afraid to plug them in and market to get some more cars. Now your ARO might drop a little bit, but your revenues and your profit might go up. Right. You know, so there is that sliding scale and you just have to know where you're at. And by the way, I, I have a couple of friends. I have one friend with six, six bays, six techs uh, doing three and a half million. I have a friend with wow. like eight bays, eight techs doing four, four and a half million a year. So you, you got to just get, you, have, you know, the law of the lid, you've got to get outside of your comfort zone and realize that you can do a lot more than what you actually think. It's like Roger Bannister in the four minute mile in the 1960s. You know, once that four minute mile was run, was run several people, even in the year after broke that barrier. So yeah. we have to, we have to realize, you know, what we don't know that conscious incompetent stage of business too helps a lot. Man, that's good stuff. That's really, really good stuff. Yeah. I, so 
once you get them in the door, and I know we're we're uh, we're probably about just over ten minutes left on on our time with you today, Brian. Uh, do you have any further advice on once you get that fish in the boat, what you're yes. doing with them? Yeah, and that and so that's exactly right because that and there's a couple other pieces to this, uh, but but ultimately the funny thing about it is just like fishing, you you never really know what you get until you get it into the boat. And, I, and I've got a lot of advanced recruiting things and, and other things and, and how you go through the interview process and all that. But at the end of the day, I mean, you could have, think you have a trophy fish on and, and when you, you're reeling it in and 30 minutes later, you get up to the boat and it's a stick or a shoe or whatever. <laughs> that was my fishing experience. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or, or it's some kind of fish that you like a carp or something. Most people don't, I mean, some people, some, some people love carp, but a lot of, like you're, if you're fishing for bass or walleye, these, these trophy fish and you reel in a carp, you're like, oh, that was fun, but that's not what I wanted. Yes. Um, so you ultimately, you, you can do a lot of things, but you got to get them in the organization and see what you got. You're never really going to know what, what kind of tech you have until they're in there. So to your point there. Um, and so Jay, I guess, follow up with that. Did, did you want to talk more about like retention or about just kind of the transition? Of I, honestly, whichever one you want to go into, Brian, because I feel like, one, an hour is not enough time for you and I to talk about this. There's just so much to unpack here. What do you think the next, I guess, uh, transition that makes sense is? Well, I'll say this. Look, you, you have to work harder than you think to keep people in your company. And I'll offer, uh, I, I believe this is a bit of a silver bullet, so to speak. So I'm, I'm going to offer it. And, and if somebody takes it seriously, I learned from a, an amazing family run dealership group that has nine, at least at one point had nine dealerships. And now the, the son of that organization is, is a business consultant, national business consultant. And I heard him talk once and he was talking investing in, in culture and, and retention of team members. And I said, hey, what, what would you then, how would you know what to spend and what to focus on in re keeping people? And, and here's what he told me, Jay. He said, there, there's three, they, they've done studies and they've sampled, I mean, hundreds and, and probably thousands of team members. And they found out that there's three, three answers a business owner, a leader of a company has to answer about their team members uh, or at least address. The first is, um, what are you doing for me personally and professionally? Do you care about me personally? Like, are we having, are we celebrating anniversaries? Are we birthdays or whatever? And, you know, are we having a Christmas party with my, my family to come and all that stuff. Okay. And then professionally, are you making a career path for me to grow? Are you giving me training? Am I increasing in hours? Am I, is my pay going up a little bit every year? Oh, am I, whatever. I mean, do I have an apprentice now that I can train? Uh, so what are you doing for me personally and professionally? Secondly is what did you do for me in a time of crisis? Mm -hmm. And so when, when COVID happened in March, we, we, it was challenging for all of us. I mean, our, uh, if I could say this, our, our, our pucker factor was pretty high, like many business <laughs> owners, because <Same> here. <laughs> we're, we're freaked out. Like we don't, I mean, to some degree you're freaked out. You don't know what exactly how it's going to flush out, but we took it as an opportunity to, to try to keep every single team member work through the pay thing, give them a guaranteed pay that they could stand on because we knew that once that was over, they were going to look back and say, you know what, here's what you did for me in a time of crisis. Uh, and I'm not trying to boast about that, but that was just our philosophy. And there's a lot of opportunities when somebody's in crisis in your company, they're going through an addiction or a divorce or a financial crisis. What do you do for them? Yes. Because they're going to remember that. And then thirdly is just this age old fix my job. So the internet is slow, the phones don't work, the dispatch process is blown up, my lift is broken, you know, whatever the case is, every team member has something. And unless you survey them, and probably anonymously would be my suggestion, it's gonna be, or, or maybe not anonymously, but just ask your team, like, what are the top two thing, or three things we could do to help fix your career or your job? And hopefully they'll tell you. And you got to focus on those things. So I, I love that idea. I think I'm going to steal that from you. The the frustrations piece and the fix my job piece. I don't know that I've heard it put so eloquently. Like that that is a uh, that is such a good point and something even for us internally at Finder Edge. I've got things in the back of my head. that I'm like, oh my goodness, yes. There's there's uh, there's some things we could fix. So I, I love that. That is sure. unbelievable advice. Yeah. So, so yeah. So what about, do you want to, I mean, we talked about this on the panel a, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Okay? You know, th th this is a conundrum for me to this day. It's, it's a difficult thing. Let's say some of you out there have these technicians that have been with you for a while, maybe 20, 30 years, maybe five years, but maybe they're 50 years old now or 60 years old now, or maybe they've got a physical ailment and they, they come to you and they say, Jay, I don't want to be a tech anymore. 
and you love this person and they've given you everything and they've made you a lot of money and served your company well, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we talked about on the panel, this, this challenge of technicians feeling like they have nowhere to go, but they, they want to be done in the shop. They want to be done turning wrenches. And I told you this last week or when we chatted or earlier in the week, when we yeah. kind of talked about this, I said, I, I struggle a lot with it. And here's why, because I, I, I can say this confidently, many, many technicians are not suited in personality type and character and skill set, or even, even just ability set to become an advisor or manager. And it's, it's really difficult because generally a technician is not a, you know, like a, an I personality type or a, even an S in many cases in the disc profile. They're not people that really, they're more introverted often than the extroverted, meaning they, they need to be away from people to recharge, not be around people to recharge. Mm. We have introverts in our company that have done well as advisors. I'm not saying they can't, but, but a lot of, you know, technicians sometimes, not always by, by any stretch, but many technicians are a little bit rough on the edges, you know, and they're okay because they're beautiful people and they're fantastic technicians and they have crushed their role and their, their job for decades. And that is so admirable. And, and no technician should ever feel like because their position isn't really, you know, sexy, so to speak, or whatever that it, they shouldn't be doing it. That is yeah. not true. That's why we have a shortage. Yes. We need to support and harness our technicians much better than we do. So, so what do you do? You know, what do you do with them? Well, I, I would say you'd have a real conversation to find out why do you want to do this? Why do you think you're going to be successful at this? Do you really, what do you think being advisor is really like day in, day out? You know, and if they start talking about, well, I know how to, I know what kind of parts it needs. I know how to estimate. Fine. If you've got a big enough shop, maybe you can make them a parts person. Mm -hmm. And by the way, these bigger shops that have four, five, six, seven technicians, I believe you can build a model where you have a full-time parts person. And we don't because our shops are not really that big. Right. But I know quite a few stores that do. So that's, that's one option. Okay. Um, and, or maybe it could be the advisor that's not as customer facing if that's not how they get recharged and if that's not how they're going to be more effective. But some other ideas, I mean, you can make them, if you've got multiple locations, this is one of the things we talked about. When you have multiple stores, you can then transition somebody into kind of a diagnostic support person. They can be a person for your company that is on call all the time. And I know companies that do this and they're just fielding calls from, let's say, BNC technicians that are actually pretty good and competent at installing parts and making repairs. They're just not great with the diagnostic process or how to recheck the car. So so that's one option. You can have a person that is just a programmer. You know, goes around with the, the factory laptops programming cars, which can take hours at a time, as you know. Uh, you can have, you know, an ADOS uh, system, you know, it, it, what is it, advanced driver automated systems, whatever that is, these yeah. new technologies. You can have somebody doing the new alignments and recalibrating things. So there are some pathways there. But, Jay, I think the reality is, is that it, it may not be the best fit staying in industry. You know, yes. um, so I know we talked a little bit about that, you know, and I, 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 you had some valid perspectives on that too, I thought. Yeah, I, that's the toughest part, I, I think. And I've had that conversation with a lot of, uh, a lot of techs that worked for me about, you know, they're getting into that 50, 55, 60 years old, that, that kind of time frame where they're looking at retirement, but they're not there yet. And it's, it's so hard. I mean, from, from a shop manager, uh, from the management of a shop standpoint in understanding what they want, because I don't think a lot of times they know what they want, right? They just know that they don't want to beat up their, their body anymore. They, yeah. they can't take the physical part of it anymore. And so trying to figure out how you take somebody that had such a good, had so much success on the shop side and be able to translate those skills into other avenues and be able to use those resources rather than just seeing them go out the door. Uh, it, it's going to take some open mindedness and trying to figure out, you know, every, every individual shop is going to be different in how they approach it and what their budget limitations are, what their, you know, the, the size of their shop limitations are. Uh, but having open dialogue and, and discussion with that technician to just say, hey, what, what is it that we can do here? You know, is there something that we could do where, you know, if we've got a, diagno a great diagnostician that they can go and help those B and C level techs out or help run quality control or doing, you know, there's, there's I think the, the most important piece is that you open your mind to try and find a spot for a good person. Yeah. And if, it, if it's just not in the cards, then 
for me, it's important that we keep these people in the industry in general, but then is it, you know, if they're not going to stay with you, do you have contacts in the industry yes. that might be able to utilize that talent? Trying to talk to other people um, because I think there's, it's a shame when we see those really, really talented people leave. Sometimes there's just, our hands are tied. There's nothing you can do. And it's one of the more heartbreaking things that you yeah. can go through. Yeah, it really is. And it, it, you're so right, Jay. I think that, I think the courteous thing and, and maybe the noble thing to do would be to reach out. We all, we all know other shops is to reach yes. out to some shops and say, Hey, do you have a place where you, you could place this person or call some of your dealerships on the parts side, the relationships that we all have yes. or, or independent parts, you know, aftermarket parts vendors and say, Hey, are you looking for somebody, you know, uh, um, I also think, and, and one idea that I had, I think on the panel was, you know, claims adjusters, insurance. Yes. And I, we've, we've met several techs that have gone into that. And it's something that you're kind of self, self-functional, much like you are in a, a bay or two in your shop. And, um, you know, and you really understand cars and you can assess things pretty well. And, you know, that, that may be something. But I also had this, this crazy idea, Jay, you know, we talked about this. I mean, like, I, I thought about well, if they're really good diagnostically or, or mechanically, but, the, but they can't use, don't use their body. You know, why didn't somebody like assemble this like diagnostic panel? Yes. I mean, or if I'm a tech, I might, I might just build a little LLC and I might start calling shops and say, Hey, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm $75 an hour or whatever, a hundred dollars an hour diagnostic support, you know, but, uh, and you know, in that way they, they sparse themselves over a number of shops and, and they can make income that way. But, you know, I think there's some creative things out there that aren't being done yet, but let's be honest, the, the mind, I mean, the hands of a technician are extremely valuable because they produce work, but the mind of a technician is going to be sharp far past their physical uh, days. Yes. And if there was a way to harness that, man, I think that would be awesome. Well, we're all going to work together on that, aren't we, Brian? We're going to try and, right. try and figure this thing out. But I know we're running up on your hard stop time here. Uh, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to join me today. I will definitely have you back on. I think there's as I'm taking notes about uh, five other subjects that we could go an hour on each. Uh, and, and so thank you for that, Brian. Congratulations on the, the shop, uh, shop owner of the year. That's a, a huge, huge, uh, I guess, achievement. And it speaks to the volume of the, the how high quality of the shops you're running. So congratulations. Uh, we're, we're proud to, uh, to know you and, and uh, proud of you for, for all of your accomplishments. Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, uh, I so much appreciate what you guys are doing because you're, you're solving what's our, what most shop owners would, would say the greatest need is, is providing skilled labor, you know, pathways to acquiring talent and also to sharpening other shop owners. Jay, we need to do this together and somebody needs to be encouraged and uplifted in their spirits today. And, uh, and thanks so much for this platform to help us grow. And you're, you're a rock star and we, we love you guys too. So thank you. Same to you. Thank you so All much, right. Brian. Have a good day. All right. You too.